Hello, everyone. Welcome to our session regarding the initiative from the Portuguese Presidency Digital Health Sustainability Post 2021 Policy Cooperation in the EU. I am very grateful to the Portuguese Presidency of the EU Council for hosting this event in the context of the eHealth Summit.pd. We are most grateful to be here. My name is Diogo Martins and work, working at the Sheriff Services of Minister of Health Portugal. Today, I will be the moderator for the session in the panel. Uh, we do have our keynote speaker, Herco Comans, uh, the, in, representing the Ministry of Health, Welfare and Sports Department. We also have as a panelist, Catriona Ray, EU Health Projects Coordinator on Department of Health Ireland, and Isabel Zablit, the E Health European International Directors at the Ministry of Health France. We will try to make this such this uh, next half an hour an exciting and insightful to all of you. Today we'll discuss the digital health sustainability and vision for the next future in the post 2021 scenarios in order to establish a collaboration in the best practice between the member states. We have been discussing the importance of strength, the policy cooperation to the leverage the development of interoperability of the e-health among the uh, EU. So right away, we are going to have uh, Erko. I have, let's say, quite of a, um, a big question, or I would like to say to really to hear from you what it is your thoughts. But Erko, as you know, EU cooperation in the public health policies has a direct uh, effect on the national ecosystems, motivating and inspiring the actors and the support of EU cooperation on their efforts to improve national systems. Erko, how you foreseen that should be the cooperation between the member states, how the member states can take the maximum of advantage for these cooperations, and now we overcome these barriers on the EU policy cooperation in the health. Thank you, Diogo. That's a very big question, I think. Um, and I will discuss and, and talk about some of the points that I think are um, necessary in that area. But one of the things that I'd like to highlight is that um, during this crisis, we really found each other in the collaboration. And we've built this uh, routine together in how we can discuss tough subjects uh, and come to quick conclusions. And I think that's something that's immensely valuable that we should build on top of uh, for the next couple of years. And um, um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Herco Komans, and I work on the international digital health uh, for the Dutch Ministry of Health, Welfare and Sport. At the same time, since the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, my directorate was asked to also lead the development of digital tools to support the Dutch healthcare services in their contact tracing efforts. And since recently, the development of an app that allows citizens to keep uh, their test certificates and in time their vaccination certificates with them. And on top of all that, I'm also the Dutch representative to the European eHealth network, of which the Netherlands is also the member state co-chair since November 2020. And I want to talk to you today about the European cooperation on digital health and the role of the eHealth network specifically. For those of you who are not familiar with the eHealth network, this is the body where all the European member states work together to advance cross-border interoperability. The eHealth network is mandated by Article 14 of the European Patient Directive from 2011 to advance the interoperability of health data by creating guidelines for cross-border exchange of patient data and creating effective methods for enabling the use of medical information for public health and research. The eHealth network is a voluntary collaboration of the national authorities on digital health. And healthcare is a national competence. The eHealth network aims to align and coordinate all our common efforts. And to achieve this objective, the eHealth network members have created the My Health at EU network of national contact points through which patient data can flow from one member state to the other in a safe, secure, and trusted manner. Member states are implementing this for patient summaries and electronic prescriptions of medication. And this work on creating a pan-European uh, pan infrastructure 
has been the main focus of the eHealth network for the past years. And then the pandemic happened. Every member state focused on managing the crisis in their own country, but soon the need for European collaboration became evident. The need for contact tracing technology to augment regular public health authorities grew, pushed by success stories in some countries outside of Europe and within Europe. Because of the freedom of movement in Europe, the need for cross-border interoperability was paramount as well. The release of the Google and Apple framework brought their massive platforms into play and gave the European member states the ability to create the interoperability guidelines. The European Commission hosts the system that connects all the national contact tracing apps that use the Google and Apple framework. And this sounds relatively simple, but it isn't. And it wasn't to get there. It meant that every member state made the necessary expertise available to do this important work. And instead of meeting only twice a year, the network mandated national experts to meet every week and sometimes every day. And because of the tremendous pressure from society and politics, tough decisions had to be made in only a few days instead of discussing these for months and months. And this required leadership, boldness and sometimes blunt directness and most importantly it required trust trust that we are in this together and that together we are making everyone stronger and this worked and within weeks we published the interoperability guidelines for contact tracing apps and launched the gateway service that connects them and by request from the european commission we are going through the same process of committing expert resources having weekly and sometimes daily e-health network meetings, drafting interoperability guidelines and rapid consensus building for the digital COVID certificates right now, the digital green certificates or the COVID certificates. And in addition to the interoperability guidelines, a trust framework was created to bring in additional safeguards respecting citizens' privacy and preventing misuse. There's one big difference with the work done on interoperability for contact tracing app and that is that the digital COVID certificate guidelines are part of the European regulation that mandates its use. And this time, the eHealth network was not just voluntary. This journey of the eHealth network illustrates the growing relevance of the European collaboration and the value of having the network as a platform available. It shows that the voluntary nature of the eHealth network can be a strength as it also means that it can quickly adapt to the immediate needs of the members. So it doesn't um, stick into the same mode uh, forever because it's set in law. And now that we are starting to see the light at the end of this dark tunnel of the global pandemic, it's good to look to the future. However, the horizon of the future of the EL network is covered by clouds. Let me explain. There are so many fundamental changes in progress within Europe. There's proposals for the EU health union that will strengthen the EU cooperation on public health and pandemic preparedness, where health data and interoperability play an important role. The European data strategy comes with proposals for data governance, cybersecurity and artificial intelligence regulations. An important part of this is the common European data spaces, including one for health data. The ambition is to create a safe, secure and privacy respecting space that will allow everyone to leverage the power of health data to improve and innovate health and healthcare. Since in many member states, healthcare delivery is a public or a semi-public service, electronic government acceleration plans also impact health data availability. And all of these impact health data interoperability at the European scale and probably beyond. The European um, uh, Resilience and Recovery Framework will release funds that help member states invest in building local capacities to support these developments. And at the same time, the mandate of the EHealth Network, the Article 14 of the Patient Guideline I mentioned before, is under review. So with that, the future of the health, uh, the EHealth Network as a best practice of European cooperation is as yet unclear. And I'd like to conclude with some lessons from the past of the EHealth network that can inform the future of European collaboration. 
first and foremost is that any collaboration needs to have clear and vis uh, visible national relevance. Ensure that results are used and not just usable in member states. And this can only be done by involving and engaging the stakeholders in the development and including implementation support and guidance in the project mission. Many collaborations are already doing this at the European scale, but it can be done more and it should be the main ambition, national relevance. And for the eHealth network, this could mean that we move from the complete consensus model to a co coalitions of the doing model from one approach for all member states to alliances of member states driving the development and implementation of a specific target, while others focus on other targets first and follow later. The second lesson comes from the recent past of how the EOS network has coped with the demands of the pandemic management. European collaboration should never be a goal in itself and should be an agile instrument. The ability to quickly add expert resources to address very specific issues, very technical, very health technical, as well as the mandates to quickly make informed decisions has been critical to the success of both the contact tracing interoperability and the digital COVID certificate guidelines. The close partnership with the European Commission and the teamwork, especially the teamwork with the national experts on many topics, created a routine that brings clarity and transparency. Transparency that is essential to keep all stakeholders on board and for the collaboration to succeed. And I hope the new mandate of the EALT network will reflect this strength and enhance its usefulness. The third lesson is that authority is earned and not given. Because of the close collaboration, the transparency and routine, we were able to build trust. The trust to know that we're in this together and that we all realize that we have to make tough decisions with impossible deadlines. Trust that we can disagree, but that we will help create the alternative and trust that we will do what it takes to make it work. In this open, honest, and sometimes blunt way of working that allowed us to build, uh, has allowed us to build authority. Now I'm not proposing to extend this high pressure collaboration beyond the crisis, but let's use the trust we've created together and build on that and recognize the value of authority that comes from working in this way, stronger together. My last point is not new, but as relevant as ever. European collaboration, and especially in the field where technology, data, health, and healthcare, and public and civil, civil values meet, it needs to involve the whole ecosystem. Government authorities should build the capacity to have citizens, professionals, innovators, industry, and other outsiders participate in the European collaboration. I have long been an advocate of patients included development at all levels, and I see many good examples, but we need to become better at this. And with these lessons, I hope to give you a sense of the direction that I think European collaboration should take in the near future. I thank you, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Erko, for the excellent insights and for sharing knowledge and your views in today's sessions for fostering cooperation in the, between the member states. I think the lessons that uh, you have uh, showed to us and, and you have sp spoken about, they are very important and, ve and very relevant for uh, the next part uh, on the session. So I would like, like to say to now to, to, to have a, a different flavor for this conversation. And uh, we will start uh, with um, a, a vision uh, from uh, Ireland uh, that uh, Catriona uh, will give us. So organizational and sustainability uh, upholding e-health policy cooperation uh, who promote and blinkler uh, work practices that allow agile response. There are crucial features to, fan, to face unexpected events like COVID-19 pandemic or other natural disasters. But flexibility must be considered as a core component and all actors, clinical, administrative, policy, ICT and facilities must orient with ease with new circumstances. Strategies in e-health e used to be focused to a specific plan, points and do not foresee unexpected events. Chris Catriona, in your vision, 
how the flexibility integrated on the, on the basis of sustainability cooperation can support the development of a strong EU community. And if there is any limit to the integrate of this concept or the member state needs to set up a common basis, what are your thoughts? Uh, you are still muted. Sorry, I apologize. Thank you, Diogo. Um, I believe sustainability in e-health policy cooperation can be realized through the co-creation of a joint agenda for EU digital services among decision makers and technical bodies, sharing best practices with well-established processes. We already know the significant investment has been made in e-health in recent years, and considerable work has already been been achieved by member states in e-health, cross-border healthcare and health information policy. Participation at a European level has also seen the direct benefit to driving improvements in healthcare and uh, it offers huge potential for the advancement of sustainability cooperation and a stronger EU community. Uh, to echo uh, Herco earlier, a clear example of the flexibility and cooperation in Europe from an Irish perspective anyway, is the recent collaboration of member states on COVID-19 initiatives, such as the EFGS and the Digital COVID Certificate. The question then we need to ask is that if it's possible to achieve interoperable contact tracing apps and digital COVID certificates for vaccination testing and recovery, there is surely an opportunity in the future to sustain some of this infrastructure for future cross-border initiatives, such as other immunization certificates, cross-border telehealth consult uh, consultations, and also to mitigate against any potential future threats to cross-border health. Work on previous joint actions in eHealth have demonstrated the impact of collaborative working among member states to drive improvements in cross-border eHealth, and it has helped to build a stronger EU eHealth community. By continuing to build on a sustainable collaborative way of working and through leveraging investments, and existing infrastructures in a prudent and scalable manner, member states will continue to see their contribution and engagement at an EU level lead to better outcomes for their citizens and, of course, enhance efficiencies for their economy. Um, in relation to limits, um, I see four main barriers to the implementation of a sustainable post-2021 digital health collaboration between member states. The first would be the need for organisational commitment. Um, between Commission and individual member states, there needs to be a committed uh, process to do the work uh, and engage on matters of sustainability in e-health. The second then would be the, to, the need to continue to build networks um, to deliver on a post-sustainable 2021 digital health collaboration. All key stakeholders need to be involved including patients and we need to continue to build our relationships and work on networks such as the national digital health networks to support and drive the implementation of this work. The third barrier I feel is lack of awareness. It will prove very challenging to place collaborative uh, efforts in digital health on a sustainable footing and ga gain buy-in from stakeholders if the relevant people are not aware of the latest developments and how they can contribute to this work. And the final barrier is twofold, and it's the availability of financial and legal supports to deliver on our post-2021 uh, digital health collaboration. This requires continued investment from Europe and support on legislation. Uh, one way this could be done would be through the establishment of a centralised portfolio management office with alignment and observation functions. This office could also promote knowledge transfer, resource efficiencies and success planning, succession planning rather, between and across projects. This there would, would increase our consistency for future sustainable collaboration post-2021. Thank you so much, um, Katrina, for the excellent answer and for the impressive work done so far.
I'm very excited to continue uh, working together with you, defining and shaping a better European community in relation to digital health. And of course, as a community and uh, as a whole, uh, like uh, Erko have said in the beginning, we are going to flourish in the next future. So we are going to change to the next uh, panelist, uh, Isabel Zablit from the Minister of Health uh, in France. So um, for you, uh, it is uh, um, working together within the different groups. It is something that it is very cultural. So building networks with institutions, organizations that are, have similar goals or challenges is a way of sharing information, a source of support, and a means to detect other similar teams progress, like for example, uh, European reference networks or the national digital health networks. In this sense, forming a group of representatives, a way of building a network, there is a vast amount of expertise and, and commitment in these networks that we can identify the factors that make them successful and leverage that against the future work. Isabel, based on your experience, what are the key factors to build a successful policy cooperation network and how the member states can support the development of the European e-health community and what are the main benefits of it? So, thank you, Diogo, and uh, hi, everybody. Uh, this is absolutely crucial. To, to really think about that to move forward in EELS. And you're completely right, because those questions are really key to the future success of what we are going to do. Um, let me take the points one by one, and maybe we, we can have first, uh, we may first have to, to step back and, and think about what is basic what it basically means to have a successful cooperation network. We've started uh, a few years ago, as, a, as Eko reminded us, with a lot of enthusiasm and a vision that ELs had to be coordinated to a certain extent at European level. But also, if we, if, we are, uh, if we agree on that, with a kind of fragile and even shy approach so far, because there was a lack of visibility and support at political level. And obviously, the pandemic crisis has definitely changed the picture certainly for the best in terms of yields as underlined by, by Katrina. And um, the recent tremendous work done in the yields network uh, was made possible, in fact, because this network did exist. And only because people knew each other and that we collectively were confident that we could make it, even with tight milestones uh, on the various projects that were mentioned uh, earlier. So that means also that we had the ability to reach out to the right experts. And here you have the recipe of a effective network uh, in action. And, um, and it worked ultimately because we were given a clear mandate and, and support from the EU Council and Commission. In parallel, we can look at the extensive work done thanks to the initiatives developed by EL's Joint Action, for instance. They have helped to, um, to better understand the EU's EL's ecosystem, which is quite various and extensive, and namely to understand what the needs and priorities were among the different, the different member states. Their conclusion shows that the Yale's community needs an aligned set of priorities at EU level and that all member states can aspire to, regardless of their stage of uh, EELS. And that's very uh, essential to have, again, an effective network in action. This means that we definitely need to keep our main asset, uh, and I refer to our European team spirit, and move to a consistent setup of a digital health team at European level, whatever the shape, so to say, but supported by a political vision and mandate. And that's a very key starting point. So how can we as a member state support the development of such a European health community? And I, I believe there are two aspects on, on this point. As soon as we have this clear vision and, and mandate regarding digital health in Europe, there is a need to integrate its objectives 
in the national roadmap, eventually to adapt this national roadmap by prioritizing the European targets. And that means a mobilization of all towards a common uh, European roadmap. And there is a lot to, of work to be done about it because mobilizing stakeholders at national level is a real, uh, you know, huge uh, action plan uh, on its own. And a second element is the fact that, uh, that, this only, uh, that this can only be done if the European targets are not theoretical ones, but are, are so to say, translated into clear and communicable objectives for both uh, health professionals and citizens. This will actually trigger the right developments also to be made by industrial companies in order to contribute to to a European health roadmap implementation. It's not only a matter of the public authorities, but also uh, a matter for the uh, whole ecosystem in EELS. And this is a strong belief. And, and basically in France, we have based our roadmap on, uh, on that vision. And, and I think that Laura explained that uh, uh, earlier in, in, in clear terms. So we do believe that we need to rely on the mobilization of all stakeholders to ensure we meet our targets. Policy statements are required to move forward, but national alignment and consistent value propositions uh, also from private sector will make it actually happen. And that's for us a second key element. So to move on the, the main benefits to participate uh, in such a, a structured network in EELS, I, I think that we can summarize it with three words, vision, reach, and cross-fertilization. Because we've observed how much the sharing of critical expertise was key to make our, our projects successful. Uh, for instance, if I refer to the effort made to bring uh, EFGS and, and the AU Digital COVID certificate live, uh, these are two clear illustrations we have uh, that, are clear, that are fresh in our minds and that have been really beneficial for all member states. And that was the power of uh, this unique network. We can dig into details, but honestly, I don't think that any countries could have done uh, better uh, on its own and eventually have done much less than what we have achieved so far. We collectively benefit from the outcomes. This point should be taken again from a political and governance perspective and we hope we are going to move on, uh, on that. This means also that if we want to keep this momentum, we need to ensure the right experts are onboarded. Uh, it's not only a question of having representatives uh, being part of a structured network, but to have the ability to call the right expert at the right time for the right project. And this is absolutely key. And um, we have now a burning platform, so to say, to have a successfully uh, working uh, uh, network. And uh, if we need, and I, and I believe we all consider we need to, to manage ambitious projects at, Europe level, at European level, and this is absolutely critical to move forward. And it should be considered not only in crisis time, but more on a regular basis. So this is uh, basically a strong belief on our side, and uh, I'm sure that uh, you all share this. Thank you, Isabel, for the accurate inputs and such straightforward uh, as an example of the usefulness of this EU cooperation. For sure, we know by heart some of the projects that we have been uh, working before the COVID with the rush that uh, uh, COVID uh, had to. And of course, I really think that there is a, a, a unique opportunity for the next funding for us to really to strive uh, as a community and really to, 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 to shape uh, the future of uh, Europe. So now I'm going to say to change a little bit um, the, the script. Uh, so the main objective uh, for the next uh, 10 minutes, it will be to have just uh, one question uh, to you, uh, exactly the same question, and for you to, to try to reply in your views, or let's say in your perspective, uh, what uh, would be um, 
would be a possible uh, uh, answer. So um, some transversal uh, core elements have been described here, of course, uh, by Erko, by uh, Catriona, and of course, by Isabel. So uh, of course, whose relevance is considered to build and streamline an ecosystem progress uh, can be highlighted such as, for example, the people empowerment access, e-skills for professionals, interoperability with the electronic health record exchange format set by the commission, new infrastructure, the demands on cybersecurity and privacy, and of course, a coordination and a governance model that needs to be applied. So as a final question to the three uh, of you, what of those elements do you consider the most important to enhance the EU policy cooperation? And what body or organization should be responsible for the coordination of those activities at the EU and at the national level? A decentralized coordination could be as a key factor, or do you think it that a centralized model would be um, a possibility? And I think uh, I would now start from um, the beginning to an end. Uh, Erko, uh, can you give uh, your views? Yes, thank you. It's a, it's a very good question, I think. Um, one of the things that I think has happened in the past few years is that not only has the European collaboration developed, but also the maturity within each member state has uh, developed a lot as well. So mm -hmm. in, in that sense, we know a lot better now what we need from the European collaboration than we did when we first started. So that's, I think, a point that should um, be made here as well. Um, one of the things I think has that has been the main um, success factor has been the focus on interoperability. And I think that's the most important one in, in, in that list. I think the others are also very relevant, but without uh, European collaboration on interoperability, all those things will fail. And those doesn't mean that the others aren't uh, as important, but for um, us to focus on the interoperability, I think will be uh, very important. And I think this is where you can see where the different kinds of, of governance models um, uh, that, that um, uh, are in use can be used here as well. Uh, we now have the voluntary um, model with the EALT network that is being added with more authority through the work that we've been doing for the past few years or the past few months, I should say. Um, and that will grow and grow and that might need to become more officially um, mandated in a, in a more formal form. Um, I don't think we should move from this model to a European authority just yet because I think the need to connect to the developing uh, e-health strategies within the member states is the key to driving the success here. So, uh, so I would go to a more formalized form or a, 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 an extended mandate of the e-health network, keep local relevance uh, in the, within the member states uh, central and focus on creating pan-global or pan-European and maybe even global interoperability. Thank you so much. Really appreciate uh, your thoughts. Uh, so, uh, Katrina, uh, what do you think about, of course, the question that I raised, and of course, uh, uh, keeping in mind the, the points that uh, Erko have raised? Um, I would echo uh, a lot of Erko's points. I, from an Irish perspective, um, we would consider, I suppose, the, de the development of e-skills for professionals as one of the integral parts of enhancing policy cooperation. Um, we can build on the work already completed in task 6.3 of the action, and which is also a follow on from the JSID work in relation to citizens and professionals. Um, build a competency framework that was suggested in, in both of those actions on digital skills for healthcare professionals and also help citizens in their digital literacy. Um, obviously, it's important that having the records, requisite skills as a healthcare professional to do your job or as a citizen to access your electronic healthcare record is a key feature amongst digital healthcare systems in all member states. Um, in relation, I suppose, to having a body or organization where, where I do echo Herco's comments, 
Um, I do think that at a, an EU level, it could be coordinated possibly through a, do a joint action with a focus on enhancing digital skills across a number of key domains. The relevant body within the Commission could be ESCO, possibly in collaboration with a number of other uh, DGs that would look at the technical skills and digital literacy, lit literacy skills, just to name a few. Uh, at a national level here in Ireland, this could be uh, led by our national authority for eHealth, which is eHealth Ireland, in collaboration with our Department of Health and our Department for Further and Higher Education. Um, again, I don't think a, a decentralised coordination um, would be the way to go. Given the success of work in e-skills coordinated centrally by the Commission, a, de it, a decentralised approach wouldn't really work. It needs to be centrally coordinated and a devolved responsibility to individual member states for its implementation. Thank you so much for that. I think it is, let's say, a different angle and a different perspective that we have uh, um, given to us. Um, Isabel, last but not the least, that I really uh, know you for a, a while. Uh, and uh, I think that we have a, a lot of things and a lot of knowledge in your backpack, e even in terms of the SMEs. Uh, and what it is really your thoughts in, in these terms of collaboration and really uh, what will be the, the, the driver to the future? Yeah, thank you, uh, Diego. Um, I absolutely agree with uh, what has been uh, just said. And uh, essentially what Kate Rene pointed out, uh, the fact that a level of centralization is absolutely necessary. Uh, we believe that also that's what I think we need common rules of the game, so to say, and a common coordination. Otherwise, nothing happened. Uh, I'd like also to, to mention the fact that a certain level of decentralization can be useful. Uh, because, uh, as Erko pointed out, we, we also uh, observe um, that the level of maturity of uh, member states in EELS has been raising over the last years, and this is an asset we can capitalize on. Um, I'd just like to mention, too, uh, the fact that uh, we are looking forward also uh, about um, to, to what the current consultation, sorry, um, will uh, produce, uh, there is a, a current consultation, as you may know, about the directive on cross-border healthcare, and uh, we believe that that could trigger also an evolution of uh, the European governance and organization related to EELS, uh, as again, uh, the direct consequence of the momentum we've gained during the pandemic and the crisis management. Um, so um, that should raise the role and the importance of the Yale's coordination efforts at European level, whatever the results are, but uh, we are looking forward to see the shape it will take. And whatever the shape it will take, we believe that that's, that certain points that uh, needs absolutely to, to be taken uh, into consideration. Governance model, we've, we've been a lot talking about it, regulation for sure, because uh, a single directive is, is certainly not as uh, enough a strong basis uh, for collaboration, interoperability, there is no doubt about it. We need to, in, to have an increased move to interoper interoperability in Europe, not only via common standards, by the way, but also via, via the leverage um, uh, effort that we have uh, by uh, the EHDSI implementation. Uh, also, the, the level of expertise, we, need, we know how much it is important uh, speaking about EELS and a moving topic uh, as EELS. So we need to have a permanent team, but also we need to have, um, uh, so to say, a, a network of uh, the, the right experts at uh, European and national levels that we can mobilize uh, upon request. Skills are essential. And um, I strongly believe we have is that uh, skills in EELS are basically a pluridisciplinary matter. And those pluridisciplinary competence, competencies sorry, are really rare. And this is something we suffer, uh, I believe, each member state at national level. And therefore, Europe could also launch an initiative to mobilize 
uh, more skills in health and their jobs. I mean, there is no doubt about it. And we are really, really um, short of the right profiles at, uh, at this point of time. Financing is, is still scarce, so to say, at European level. eu 4 l is a first step, but to, uh, needs to be developed. Uh, and the uh, ELS project should uh, should gain uh, uh, in importance. We have the European Health Data Space uh, coming soon, but it's not only about that. Uh, and we need to to have a, a strategic strategic plan for uh, financing ELS project. Innovation should be a common uh, driver of the agenda. And uh, last but not least, from a, a French perspective, we are absolutely convinced that our unique, so to say, value proposition for health in Europe is about ethics. That makes, that makes our approach quite unique. We, have, we had a lot of discussion regarding our recent projects about what is the ethical uh, uh, perspective about those projects. We see that the reaction to, for instance, uh, now the the, the digital um, the EU digital uh, COVID uh, certificate are also related to ethical uh, questions, and uh, we have an expectation from citizens and health professional, and um, because they they believe that Europe could be in a position to best answer the questions, and uh, therefore we we may consider to move forward with the right framework, uh, including uh, ethics by design. So this is a, a strong belief that we have to, to move forward. And we, you can rely, I would say, on France to help move forward on those key points and raise uh, ethics as a common basis for our future steps. And uh, this is actually something we'll certainly include in our agenda for the French presidency of the EU. Uh, not following yours, but uh, Slovenia, who's going to, to be next. So thank you so much for your thoughts and uh, of course, uh, a lot of uh, likeness uh, in these specific topics. So unfortunately, uh, we came to the end of this session. It was really very pleased to have you uh, here uh, with us in the uh, Yelp Summit.pt and of course to be a partner uh, in the Portuguese presidency. Uh, I think in terms of the, 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 the summarize, I think there is two main axes that I think I would like to echo. It's of course the cooperation and the level of knowledge that we share at the European level. It is something that for sure we still need to continue um, this path and this progress. The second uptake and the second um, main part, it will be of course about uh, the uh, the national uh, ecosystem and how can we connect the different dots between the different authorities and how can we create this national digital health network and have a common baseline uh, to hit by having in mind, at least in my perspective, three main axes. The people, for them to gain trust, even the healthcare professionals and the citizens to gain trust about digital health. The processes, how uh, the, the, the health entities and how the different uh, clinical processes will be connected. The technology, how interoperability will allow to change the paradigm from e-health to health that in the few years we are going to just to see the intrinsic work of ICT in the healthcare delivery and really in the center of, this, it, uh, of it, it is what we are doing today. It is a coordination activities towards a sustainability future uh, for that. So for that reason, thank you so much for your time. Stay tuned because a lot of the topics that we have been raising here are going to be in some other sessions in the summit. And I'm very grateful to have you uh, with uh, my uh, panelists and uh, speakers on the day. Thank you so much for that.